we've talked a lot about externalizing and internalizing coping strategies. Is that all our options? Well, no, there's a third type of coping strategy, often called pro-social or positive coping. And this is ultimately the goal. This is what we're trying to lead towards, but it is the hardest to learn to develop. Examples of positive coping include things like rationalization. This is the idea of not ruminating and just torturing yourself and playing back a bad memory, but actually thinking about it in a more logical, rational way and realizing you're not to blame, but the other person isn't either. So this is the idea of thinking about your test and saying, oh my gosh, I think there was just a misconception on that test. Maybe you didn't scan properly. Maybe I just need to ask them about that. Or if you got broken up with say, you know, we just, we didn't fit well together. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't my fault. We just didn't fit well together. Or if you were late for a, or if you're late for a job interview, just saying, look, I couldn't have anticipated that traffic jam. It happened, but it's not my fault. It, it just happened. And so now it's the idea that you're rationalizing and say, okay, no one's to blame. There's a real explanation for this. Another type of positive coping strategy is assertiveness. This is the idea that if you think there was a problem on the test, you reach out to the teacher in a not blamey sort of way, just saying like, hey, I think there was a problem. Do I get to go over my answers? And it might've just been an honest mistake on either person's side. Or you the idea that you just reach out and say, look, I just want some closure as to why you dumped me. Can you just let me know and not ghost me? And that would be okay too. And then there's also just explaining when you get to the meeting, look, I'm really sorry. There was this traffic problem. I didn't anticipate. Can we rebook the interview or are you okay to be, or are you free now? Now, sometimes this assertiveness may not feel appropriate. For instance, with the breakup, you may not feel like you could go and ask for that feedback. So instead you could use a third type of pro-social coping known as mediation. So if you think the other person, your ex is going to ghost you, maybe you'll ask a mutual friend, can you just, try and get some info as to why they did that or check on them and see how they are and not in a creepy way, but just in a straightforward way and, uh, and just try and see if I can get some closure. Then mediation may feel more appropriate. So rationalization, assertiveness and mediations are things that we definitely have to work on throughout our life. And they're definitely things that in some cultures and in some family backgrounds may be harder to do. For instance, we know assertiveness may be something that's been discouraged in a lot of families. So then you have to try and grow this extra new skill. Now, when we think about positive coping, there's also things we can just do for ourselves, not with the other person. And we think about the things we can do to reflect on ourselves. There's lots of physical, emotional, and cognitive things we can do. This is not an exhaustive list, but I wanted to just highlight a few of them. There is the relaxation of breathing techniques we'll talk about in a little bit. There is a low stress diet, having time for exercise, better time management, and encouraging yourself to get as enough sleep and rest as you need. In terms of emotional coping, there is getting your social support, recognizing your emotions like we talked about in Unit 10, having better communication skills, practicing that assertiveness, and releasing your emotions and not bottling them up. And finally, with cognitive, there is things like constructive thinking and rationalization. Distraction to an extent can help in the immediate term until you're ready to cope with something. Taking a more task-oriented mindset so you're not dealing with your emotions, you're dealing with the problem and moving towards acceptance if there is nothing else to do. And so we're gonna talk about these physical, emotional, and cognitive coping, but not all of them, just a few of the select ones now. So let's jump into some physical coping. One of the things that I recommend people do when they are experiencing a lot of stress, when they first become aware that they're experiencing a lot of stress, is to do a body scan or a body check. And this is the idea that you just ask yourself some simple questions because our physiological health can really impact our psychological health. So the idea of saying, you know, you're really cranky, you're really emotional right now. When was the last time you slept? And be very common for someone to say, well, no, I pulled a couple all nighters or I'm barely getting three hours of sleep at night or I really haven't slept in a long time. Well, that might be the first thing to do. If you are really upset about something, go to sleep. A second thing is, are you hungry? Maybe you need to eat. If food does not just fuel us in terms of physiologically, it also fuels us psychologically. And hanger is a real emotion. So making sure you have something to eat is very important. Ask yourself if you've exercised. As physiological, biological beings, we need to exercise to feel good. And not having regular exercise can really heighten your level of anxiety. So making sure you do something as simple as going for a walk can really matter. And asking if you're hydrated. 
believe it or not, drinking water actually reduces your stress hormone cortisol. So making sure you're well hydrated can actually help you to be more resilient and to cope with more stressful events better. And then a couple other questions that have to deal with our body. You know, have you spent time in nature? Are you taking any prescription medications that you need to take on a regular basis? Or have you withdrawn from any of them suddenly? And are you treating your other physical conditions? Do you have any other health conditions that need to be managed in order to help your psychological health? So that's something I recommend right from the outset of somebody's experience, a heightened level of stress. And particularly when it comes to the hungerness, I want to talk about our fuel. This is very simple. We've learned this in elementary school, but I just really, but I just really want to reinforce it that our food is more than our physical fuel. It also helps us with our psychological hungriness. And so the idea is we do eat when we're stressed out because eating can actually help to keep us calm. But if you are eating and you are ingesting things to help you calm down, it's important to try to stay away from the really sugary things. It's important to not use caffeine. Caffeine can actually make us more anxious. Alcohol can make us a little bit less anxious, but it's important to try and not become reliant on alcohol and drugs. Over the long term, those are just going to make us feel more depressed and more weary. The best fuel for us that actually sets us on the right path from the get-go is things like vegetables, fruits, water, and lean proteins. That's the type of fuel our body needs to stay more healthful. So just thinking about that and thinking about the fuel you put in your body and the implications that could have on your mind can really matter. Now, aside from physical coping, also emotional coping is really important and recognizing and dealing with your emotions is of course important, but I want to really highlight the idea that a shoulder to lean on is essential. So this is the idea of having someone to talk to. We don't all have someone we can be open with and be vulnerable with in our lives. We may not have someone in our household we feel safe chatting with. And that realistically, a physiological hug or a cuddle can go a long way. It's amazing the types of hormones that are released in just a nice little cuddle or hug or hand holding and having that can be very beneficial. And if you're not in a position in your life where you're able to receive enough attention, love and respect from those around you, that's something to be aware of. You're not to blame for that, but you can find ways to fulfill that. For instance, we know things like stuffed animals, they work, teddy bears work even for adults and things like pets. Pets can be amazing, even if it's not a cuddly pet, but a pet you can watch from a distance, those can actually help to lower our stress level too. Even having a plant, even if it's a cactus or a succulent that you don't really have to work hard at keeping alive, that can lower your stress level because if you talk to the plant, if you spend time looking at the plant and drawing pictures of the plant or photographing the plant, that can actually help to lower your stress level. And if you don't have someone you can talk to, Finding the way to call the local distress hotline or calling an emergency line to talk to someone when you're in need can really help to lower those stress levels. And finally, when it comes time to cognitive, we have to think about some coping phrases. So in terms of coping, sometimes we can really make things a bigger issue than what they are. And in that case, I like to offer the coping phrase, it's not that big of a deal, it's perfectly fixable. If we find ourselves in those times of heightened stress, we may find every little thing to be a problem. You know, a bad hair day, a stain on your shirt. And you have to say, that's not a big problem. I can change my shirt. I can brush my hair. It's okay. It's perfectly fixable. In other times, our stress may be something more of a big deal, but you have to say, well, I'm doing my best already. There's nothing else I can do right now. If you are not getting your job done, if you're not getting perfect straight A's, if you are making people upset because you're not perfect enough for them, you have to realize that you can't be perfect enough for them and your best has to be your best. If your best isn't good enough to fulfill their desires, they're the problem, not you. And your best is not you staying awake for seven weeks straight, pushing yourself through a semester. Your best is staying reasonably healthy and doing your best when you have a reasonable lifestyle. Now, in some cases, you encounter stressful things that are not yours to own. Let's say a loved one's sick and all of a sudden their responsibilities fall on your shoulders. Well, you have to tell yourself, this is beyond my control and responsibility. It's beyond my control that they're sick. It's beyond my control that all this stuff happened. And I'm not going to do it well, but that's okay. It's beyond my responsibility. So sometimes life throws us curveballs that we shouldn't have to own. And recognizing that, recognizing that this was not your responsibility, it's now in your court, but it's not your fault that this happened, takes a lot of the ownership of that stress off your shoulders and you realize that you can breathe. 
Now sometimes we have that anxious voice just saying the what if, the what if, the what if, and thinking about the future. And if you find that happening, I like to use the phrase, it's not happening in the present, and there's no actions I can take towards it right now, so I should just focus on the here and now. That can really help that, that can really help if you're thinking about something that you have to start next week or you have to start tomorrow and you're not getting your work done now. So thinking about just getting done what needs to happen right now can really help to lower the stress level. Now let's say something like you do mess up. It is your fault. It was your responsibility and you didn't do your best. It was a mistake that you could have done better. How do you relieve your stress in that situation? Well, Try saying it's a, there's a perfectly reasonable and logical explanation for this and I shouldn't feel guilty. You didn't do it because you're a bad person. You did it because you're a human and every human is going to make mistakes. So this is the idea if you're late for a job interview because you didn't plan accordingly. Well, there was a reasonable and logical explanation for why you didn't plan accordingly and you are going to allow yourself to make mistakes. And then finally, for those really big times in life where things actually go off the rails pretty bad and there is no silver lining, what can you say to yourself? You might want to use, it might not turn out the way I want, but even in the worst conditions, I know I'll get through somehow. And this may be the one that you use a lot in this pandemic. If we're losing loved ones, we're losing jobs, or we're losing our houses, what can you say? You'll get through somehow. It may not be what you want, but you'll get through. And so these coping phrases can help you to refocus your mind and say, okay, I heard you stress, I'm aware, I'm aware, thank you body, thank you brain, you've brought this threat to my attention, now can you go, now can you go, I can dismiss you now and get on with the tasks I need to do. I will get through this somehow, but just ruminating about it all day is not effective.